Children who are the regular bedtime routines don't do well with sleep. That's been shown in study after study after study. There's a lot of children who are going to bed after 9 o'clock at night, and those children have short sleep trajectories that persist right into school age. So once you've established that pattern, it's very difficult to break. It's amazing how many children have television or watching movies as part of their bedtime routine. And I'll get a lot of parents saying to me, well, we wind down by watching a video. You are not winding your child down by watching a video with your child. There's evidence that shows that TV or video watching or being in front of a computer actually stimulates the retina and um, interferes with kind of resetting their, their sleep so that they're getting into a quiet state so they're getting ready for nighttime sleep. So it's not a good thing to have television as part of the routine or videos. And children without daytime naps, as I've already said, sleep worse at night. They have more fragmented sleep and they're harder to settle. And then the other problem they're picking up on, and I've certainly picked up on in my work, is inconsistency between the routines for napping and the routines for settling at night. And we'll get into that in more detail. So what are some sleep promoting strategies? Consistent daytime and nighttime routines are absolutely critical. So what I find, I'll, I'll say to parents when I'm talking to them, how many of you are parents? Oh, lots. Okay. Do any of you have what I would call intense children? Yes? Okay. So I call intense children, I like to use that word because I think it's a good word. Um, it, intense children are children who um, love the world. They engage with the world. They think the world is the greatest place since sliced bread. They love interaction. They love being with people. They're outgoing. They're gregarious. They just want action happening all the time. And they thrive on it. The only problem with these intense kids is they have a lot of difficulty setting their own limits. They have a lot of difficulty calming themselves down and saying, OK, I've had all my stimulation. Now it's time for me to put a lid on it and go to sleep. Um, these kids really require consistent daytime and nighttime routines. You have to teach them to anticipate what's coming. And the only way they can anticipate what's coming is if they, they have the very same cues operating that say to them, it's almost time for you to go to sleep now. And if you give them the consistent routines between naps and bedtime, they can start to anticipate sleep. And moms have described it to me that I've worked with, where the kid used to be screaming her head off when her mom carried her into the bedroom to go to sleep. And then after she started to really work on this consistent bedtime and nap time routines, she kind of get this little look on her face and she kind of get this little smile and go, <sighs> because she knew that what was coming and she could relax into it. So it's very, very important, particularly for those kids, that it's consistent between night and day. And that then also it's cons important that you are consistent in what you do. Boring as heck for you, but important for your kid. Same story, same song, same whatever. Not every time it's different. In fact, a mom called me the other day, and she's, she's got twins, and I've been working with her now for, uh, I don't know, her kids are one and a half, so since they were babies. So we get these long-term relationships. Anyway, um, and she said, oh, you know, I've been putting my twin down for her nap, and she's freaking out. She won't go to sleep now. She's been sleeping beautifully since you intervened, and, you know, we've, it's been great. And so I said, well, talk to me about what's happening. Well, she's gone to part-time work. She was putting her baby down for the nap and then leaving, and then the, the care provider was there when she woke up. Oh, well, that was not a happy baby. Okay, so I said, you gotta let the care provider put her down for her nap. So the same person's there. When she wakes up from the nap, who's putting her down for her nap? Problem solved, okay? So it's not paying attention to those sleep associations and what's happening with the kids while they're um, going to sleep and then waking up. Consistent meal times are really important. There's a lot of parents now who are into the grazing approach. So their kids graze all day long and there's no consistent meal times that are kind of offered. And there's no consistent nap times either. And everybody's out doing everything. People really bought into that 
it, you know, you have to stimulate your kids for the first three years of life or it's game over, they're toast. Yeah, the baby Einstein stuff. And we're responsible for that as care providers and we need to wear it because it's caused a whole generation of parents to think that their kids have got to be out there 24-7 practically, swimming um, in toddler groups, in painting classes, in all kinds of stimulating activities. And the routines end up being the casualty of that. The feeding routines, the sleep routines, they're not totally flexible. They can't just go with the flow. They can't, most of these kids can't have every day look different than every other day. They don't, they don't deal with that well. So it's really important to have these consistent meal times. Using beds as a place for relaxation and sleep, not for play and not for punishment. So you don't want to be doing the time out in bed because that's giving the kid a message that bed's not a good place to be. That's where they go when they're bad. And you don't want to use um, beds for play that should be used for sleep. That's part of good sleep hygiene. Limiting carbonated um, drinks or caffeine intake afternoon. Um, I went to this fantastic presentation in Vancouver by Judith Owens, who's a sleep guru from the US, and she was talking about the amount of caffeine our kids are being exposed to now, and it was frightening, absolutely frightening. Starbucks coffee has three times the caffeine in it of other forms of coffee. Um, kids are now eating chocolate bars that have caffeine added. They're eating little candies that have caffeine added. She, sh she had a whole bunch of products she was showing on the screen, and caffeine intake is just going through the roof. And um, lots of carbonated soft drinks have a lot of caffeine in them, and not just Coke. Clear ones like Mountain Dew or Sprite have quite a bit of caffeine. And occasionally you see kids being strolled down the street with a b bottle with pop in it. So those kids are getting ca caffeinated drinks, and you've got to really limit their intake of that because it's going to affect their sleep. We've already talked about avoiding stimulation and parental presence at sleep time. We don't want to be getting into raucous play with kids half an hour before they're going to go to sleep. So throwing them up in the air and catching them, not a good idea. Some kids find bath time incredibly stimulating. And I just read an article in the newspaper that was published by a woman in the UK who called it bedtime bedlam. And she had three kids in her household between the ages of 14 and 2. And she said she never got any of these kids to bed before 11 o'clock at night. And sleep was just all over the place. And one of the things she described was her two-year-old in the tub getting ready for bed. And the other two siblings coming in and dive bombing her and throwing toys in the bathtub and splashing her. And does that sound relaxing? No. And some kids um, really respond to baths by being stimulated by them. So you need to look at the kid and figure out, is this a stimulating activity or is it relaxing? If it's relaxing, it's okay to leave it as part of the bedtime routine. If it's stimulating, it needs to go to some other part of the day and not be part of the bedtime routine. Bedrooms should be dark, not too warm, and noise should be kept to a minimum. And, I, and uh, there's a video going around right now. I'm part of the MCDG, the Maternity Care Discussion Group. Uh, Karen is too, I think. And uh, have you seen the video with the dad climbing into the crib with the baby? <laughs> no, I missed that. So this one just came out. So there's this kid in a crib. She looks like she's about nine months old, maybe. She's crying her head off. There's bumper pads in the crib, which we all know is not a good thing. Um, and there's bl a big blanket in there. And the dad comes in, and he's trying to lie her down and you know, calm her down. She's kind of pulling herself up the side of the crib. And she's just screaming, and she's not going to do it. So he literally climbs into the crib and puts her on him. And she goes to sleep on this dad. And this dad is crunched up in this crib, right? Because obviously, they're not designed for a dad. And She's asleep on his chest, and, and this video shows him trying to ease her off his chest <laughs> onto the bed and get out of the bed. And of course, every time he tries to do this, she just crawls right back on, and she's burrowing under his armpit, and she's burrowing into his waist. I mean, there's no way this kid's letting this dad get out of the crib. It's hilarious, except that it's not hilarious for the dad, who's lying there with this expression on his face like, oh, no, you know, and he's... This video goes on for some time, so I don't know how long he ended up being in the crib with her. And it's a good thing cribs are built to a big weight, because this guy was pretty big. He wasn't small. 